for the last presentation, <coughs> there were some, by the way, who actually was for uh, Fear and Shaken, who suggested? Okay, one hand, okay, okay, yep. Um, Let's Yay. Right. So, um, don't be fooled by the name. It has nothing to do with making cocktails, this kind of a stir and shake and stuff. Um, does anyone have any kind of idea what's all about it? So, let's see. Uh, who wants to give it a try at least to explain what's the problem? This wants to try, I don't know. It's okay, right? It's give it a try. So, uh, as I understand it, it's something to do with the, the CLIs that have been sent through the network and not verified to be long to the person who's sending it. So, it's essentially spoofing CLIs. And the solution is somewhat public key cryptography to say that the person who's sending the CLI owns the CLI. Oh, we've got permission to use it, really. Yeah, actually, yeah, the problem the, the Fear and Shaken guy is trying to solve is about uh, validating the actual CLI in the code because, yeah, okay, anyone can uh, feed it into the in a zip code uh, as uh, RP or whatever in the whatever format and a CLI that's without actually owning it, so basically spoofing the caller uh, ID and uh, and more particularly, this is for, uh, let's say, fighting against the so-called robocalls. So you just receive a bunch of calls with fake identities, and you never know who actually who's actually calling you. And um, there are two parts uh, in uh, in the whole solution. Uh, there is a steer which comes from uh, secure telephony identity revisited. Wow. It's fancy. Uh, as the name says, it's a way of trying to secure the, the, the call ID itself. The second part, the shaken, it's a secure handling uh, of uh, asserted information using tokens. Basically, it's the mechanism used to, uh, um, to uh, encrypt and decrypt and validate the actual CLI information into into the SIP uh, uh, the SIP uh, message. Uh, the whole solution it's not so uh, let's say simple as yeah okay we trust it or not so it's not like a binary kind of information because usually a call goes through multiple entities you can have you know a regular phone generating the uh, the actual call going through a PBX getting out maybe going through some wholesale provider and getting to a gateway and so on so it, you may have a longer path. Um, between uh, the actual two endpoints of the call, and the idea is how to propagate, how to validate between all these points the information. Hey, do we trust this or not? Um, and uh, just to show you how it works, I will uh, abuse a bit the website of the TransNexus guys. They did a great job documenting um, this uh, steer and shaken. Let me share with you. <coughs> yeah, so basically the whole idea on how it works, you have the two endpoints. You may have a bunch of big servers in the middle, and the idea is how this party will, try, uh, will trust the CLI which was initially filled in by, uh, by the colleague. So, uh, how it works, information about the CLI is at a point filled in into the message. It gets let's say, kind of a score in terms of how trustful the information is. And then to provide any kind of man-in-the-middle attack is um, encrypted with a uh, certificate. The whole certificate, how this uh, distribution of the certificate works, it's a completely different piece mechanism. Basically, there are some authorities, so external authorities that are from the SIP server holding the certificate, so you 
just go set the certificate for the encrypt the other party receive information in the feed message about the certificate and to go there set the certificate and also to the decryption uh, of, of that uh, in order to uh, see the, um, the the information so basically at the end point uh, relies on kind of a I wouldn't go so far to call, call it a centralized authority uh, even it has a name of uh, forgot about what was that um, policy administrator anyhow it's not as far as I understood it's not yet in place it's not yet fully functional functional so it's more like uh, island in terms of uh, uh, propagating this uh, certi certificate for the moment but the plan is to try to centralize everything to a certain point in terms of signing the certificates and distributing them for usage and um, now what the actual information placed inside let me do some Come on. yep So as I said, um, there are different levels of trust in terms of the, of the CLI. So basically, it's a combination. If you can, uh, you can authenticate the party sending you the call, and then if you can, uh, if you are sure about, you know, um, if the party is actually authorized <coughs> to use the CLI. So you have all these uh, three levels. Uh, the full one, the A, is like yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm 100% sure about it, and then uh, the B is, yeah, okay, I trust the source, but I'm not sure exactly, you know, about the mapping and between the CLI and the endpoint, and this is more like a kind of a proxy way where you have not much of an idea. So, depending when the information is populated, you have to assign one of these levels for the, you know, for the level of trust, and then uh, the information is uh, encapsulated uh, basically in an uh, uh, already existing mechanism in SIP, it's called the identity <coughs> header. Um, it was used also by some old mechanism, I'm not sure how, let's say, used are. Usually you're, uh, you're collecting a bunch of information from the SIP message, like uh, uh, from user, uh, to user, and some like, something like this, and you uh, were, uh, you were um, encrypting them in the message again to avoid man, man in the middle attack more or less the same mechanism but different information it's used also for uh, for uh, steel and shaken and just to see what kind of information is uh, to be uh, populated um, well that's the final result some huge uh, um, encrypted uh, data it's actually um, yeah, it's uh, okay. We have here. There are like uh, three, uh, three parts. There are some uh, encoded and then encrypted uh, JSON um, tokens with information about the certificate and actually the <coughs> payload itself, which is uh, the useful information, like in the first part. Uh, in the header, that's the encoded. Decoded is some typical information, in this case, quite static about, uh, about uh, uh, Shaken, uh, more or less about the certificate itself. So you, uh, you know how to validate after that the information. And uh, if we look to the actual payload, in the information we have the, uh, the level of trust here and then uh, this is the destination number and uh, okay there's a timestamp and the caller ID information so all this number uh, all this this information is part of that JSON and then part of that uh, encrypted uh, uh, piece of data that uh, ends up in the identity header and it's carried um, in the SIP message all the way uh, from the caller to callee so anywhere on the path of this uh, call you can double check if the if the identity header is over there. You can uh, double check, you know, how trustful the uh, caller is. So basically, it covers more or less two areas. Of uh, first of all, um, 
giving a level of trust, and secondly, avoiding any kind of spoofing with many in the middle attack. So with a certificate, you can uh, verify also the validity of the uh, information. Um, more or less, that's the that's the whole uh, secret um, about it. It's not how to say some. Yep. Uh, both of, I don't know what, we lost the mic. Where's Alex Kuhler from Jesus! Um, keep pausing. Is that mic working? No. Good stuff. Dupont Dyke. Yeah. Handing around a cold potato. Who are my Thank you, I'm afraid I feel a bit stupid looking at this, but I'm trying to pick up the pieces and piece it together. Um, you're not the only one. It, it, is there an assumed trust between the ingress service provider and the egress service provider? Well, through this uh, certification mechanism, yeah, they share more or less. At least, I mean, they uh, um, they are able to use the same encryption decryption uh, mechanism to be sure that nothing is changed, and then. Ideally, the, origin, um, the origination point should decide what the level of trust you link into the message and then propagate. So, to a certain point, someone has to take, uh, let's say, job slash risk to decide for the very beginning what's the level of trust for the uh, for the CLI. That may be, let's say, a, a BID provider, maybe a uh, PBX when it sends a call out. Uh, or any kind of other uh, entity, and depending on how much information it has about if the endpoint authorized to use the CLI, it may decide what level of trust to assign. So if, if I'm the, well, the service provider for the call in, then the information I will receive is A, an assertion or a way of validating that the CLI has not been changed from caller's service provider, yeah. I know who the caller's service provider is. Uh, at a certain point, I mean, you may not know it directly because but there'll be some reference to the certificate somewhere. Uh, the certificate, yeah, to give you the guarantee because you know who signed it. So you know who signed it. Yeah. <coughs> and it's then your job as the receiving service provider to say, was that service provider a someone I trust? No, that's, uh, that's part of the how the certificates are distributed. So once we, you have all these mechanisms yes. to distribute the, uh, the certificates, automatically there is a trust relation between all the operators using the mechanism. And then you so have to trust the other guys. You, uh, you, you, know, you know who it is at least, and right. you make the judgment yeah, call. Right. 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 But I can maybe fill in for the middle of this. Please. So <laughs> you have <laughs> the certificate of authority, right? Like. With radio CCI, that's what you're telling me. You rely on and trust that whoever is seeking the CLI, the calling party, provider, is guaranteeing that that number belongs to that person. They hold the uh, the liability if it turns out not to be them, that there is supposed to be a cost associated, a lawsuit, whatever. They are guaranteeing that it is who owns that number, and then your trust is a root certificate owned by the CDCA. Guaranteed that the data hasn't changed from where it was uh, initiated and you provide them, and you, when you dispose it as the employee, provide But there is no explicit contract between the so police <coughs> service provider and I the police service provider. Correct. So um, I get the feeling that this comes out of the United States because we have a big problem with mobile calling, and like most things generated by um, a requirement from the U.S. government, it is found in Siri to find nothing. And so there's a lot of big question marks. So the FCC and the FCC are guaranteeing today that they will sue the crap out of somebody who doesn't tell the truth on that. But there's also a lot of other stuff here. I apologize if we sort of stop no. back some opinion here. But there's a bunch of big question marks that really stink about this. Um, technically, it sounds good, but uh, so the first thing is that your PA, whoever owns that cert, is almost certainly going to charge you to dip again. So there's going to be additional costs associated. 
There's also going to be TV really involved where you send your request up to be validated. And obviously you're blocking that call, right? You can't deliver the call if you can't guarantee that the call is targeted to the standard line. So what the hell is a TV doing? You know, and I think for me it's Verisign who's pushing this. And you so are. and you oh on the CA side it's just you on, the yep, it's on, on the CA side it's Verisign. That's right. On the CLLI side, it's Verisign. I mean uh Mustar. This is actually the business that Mustar is actually getting into too, right? <coughs> yeah, Having they, lost all the the impact. The impact so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um one of them was Sky Sports did a bit. And the last thing I heard was that uh, it's going to be something there, else yeah. that's expensive. So the idea is, is that where did robocalling come from? Calling is pretty much free right now, right? I mean, in general, it's like sending an email. It's easy to you know, send millions of calls out to the trust level. So by making all of these zip codes, it makes calls really expensive. So you're going to kill robocalling as a choice. Well, of course, it's just sending emails, right? I mean, it's working out that. is what it is. Um, but how many years or decades <coughs> do you think it's going to take to implement? That depends how, how bad they hit the first one and how much. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, from uh, just to answer to that question, <laughs> you may. Uh, Take a look. I, by uh, chance, I got some information about this. For example, there is a uh, SIP forum announced. Uh, that will be in uh, December, the SIP NOC, which is the uh, uh, SIP Network Operator uh, Conference. And the main interest is here in Shaken, especially they are saying that there are already companies, uh, telecoms, implementing uh, uh, they mention uh, 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 AT and T and T Mobile. But there is a possibility to install application if you call from Samsung to Samsung or something like this. Well, that's already some something completely different. <laughs> I think I think most liability, um, at least between themselves. Like, look, I've got a really great hearing arrangement with you and you have a really great hearing arrangement with me. Why don't we just do this and make sure that I can trust you and you can trust me. In an effective way, they've just pushed the liability. They've switched it effectively, pushed it onto each other. I mean, it may may end up, you know, with the, like all the discussion that were like, uh, what, uh, maybe uh, 15, maybe more years ago about the well-known enum, where there was a huge fuss about it and then it died. But, uh, well, that works. So I, I know some people that still love that company. <laughs> <laughs> so without, uh, without trying, you cannot win any commission. So, yeah, it may be something at the end. It may not be. You never know. To agree with this gentleman here, I will tell you that this is most likely financially, you know, motivated. Because the U.S. is like one of the few countries that <laughs> use uh, CNA. They have actually a, a C name um, in their SSF, <coughs> and they charge for it. And uh, it's a great way that these carriers are still making money, but even that's starting to diminish. So new shit like this. Sometimes you got to think that, like, if the carriers really wanted to, they probably are the ones at the spear point to, like, kill spam. But they're allowing it to happen, I think, because they're just trying to find new ways of making money. Does anyone have any other questions for both now? Oh. You've suddenly become a professional on this. <laughs> so the certificates that for when sending the call, are those a unique certificate per number per CLIA and I that's sent? It's not per number, it's per per whatever operator entity is from. So 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 they'd have they'd have a single certificate. So that means it wouldn't be too much increased TDD because we wouldn't need to do it dip every time we do it. Not on the certificate, no. Right. Because so what, the what, certificate's what, basically the same, I mean, just, you know, there's a trust provider. Yeah. So what, what do we need to do a dip for then? Because the, the, the whole PKI thing is so we can verify that message by itself without having to look to an external body. 
if we verify the, the provider of the certificate once, you're not going to need to again. So in the Indies, you probably are not. But what if you get a bureau receipt? But how, what what's the bureau receipt? Is that how they? Get? I mean, at that point, you're going to need to somehow research and and create additional trust yourself before you actually make the decision to send this call out. So if you right, have so a mechanism to, to figure out if okay, do you trust or not? That's your life. And that is something one of the services that Newstar is starting to, to spin up, I believe, is that they're eating up all of the, the LIDB providers out there. They're the biggest storage provider for CNAME in the United States. But <coughs> by getting all of that in and knowing which provider it's with, and maybe even having some customer record information, some billing information available to them, which is, now they can charge for that. Okay, look, you're getting these Bs and Cs from this provider. You want to be with this provider because they're cheap? Well, they're probably cheap because like, they don't do anything to like regulate any of this crap. So do you want to be in the liability line or do you want to dip me every time he sends you something that's a C? Give me a little bit of money and make sure that you're paying insurance and I get sued. Any other questions? I think we've beaten this one to death. <laughs> Are you getting a tattoo? Are you getting stir or shaken? <laughs> shaken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's awesome. So that is going to conclude the talks at this year's 2019 Open Sip Summit. We've got a couple of exciting things for you to participate in. The good news is you have to do nothing but sit in your seats. Let it happen. <laughs>